little bit differently, like I was saying. So we like to get to know the team a little bit better. So if you guys are in the audience, go ahead, take a look at that AMA polls channel, just a couple, a uh, couple channels up from the stage, and uh, you can go ahead and react to those messages, see what you would do, and we're gonna go through one by one with both Kato and Kel. And uh, or do you want me to? Do you go by Daniel Moore or Kato? Um. It's a mix, but whatever you're more comfortable with, I'm, <laughs> I'm fine with either, honestly. Uh, okay, um, awesome. Kevin and Crypto calls me Kato for the most part, but... Gotcha. Yeah, done. that's all I've heard you referred to as by a uh, Cyril, yeah, yeah. so that's why I got, I got kind of used to it. Um, yeah. But, yeah, all right, so let's get into it if you guys are ready. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so fantasy or sci-fi? Uh, we might split here. Um, Cal might disagree with me. I'm probably more of a fantasy person. Um, you know, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, yeah, um, and well, I guess Viking stuff isn't really fantasy because it really happened, <laughs> but that, that's that's more my thing. Um, I'd consider it more fantasy than sci fi, though, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. That kind of medieval genre, I'm a big fan of that, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think they're both fantastic, and really, like, you just want to swap it out for magic or for laser guns, so the choice is yours. It's almost like they, they, they're kind of interchangeable if you, if you really think about it. <laughs> well, but you yeah. want to get crazy. Yeah. Do you like magic <laughs> or do you like technology? Why, exactly. why do I have to choose, man? This is a Reese's peanut butter cup of like all the <laughs> I love. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I definitely am a, more along the lines of fantasy myself. Um, but at the same time, some, like some good sci fi movies and, and shows really, I think, uh, can be really awesome as well. Um, all right, books or movies? I would love to say books. I feel like books is the more, uh, you know, mature decision, but I'm definitely a movies man. I'm <laughs> too lazy. <laughs> a few, don't get me wrong. Being truthful in the moment. I love books. Books are fantastic. I just watch a lot of TV and movies. Yeah, um, I'm a big film buff. It's what I did. Uh, what I studied at college or university, whatever you call it. Um, and I love watching films. I've seen thousands, probably. <laughs> yeah i'd have to say 90 percent of the time the book is better than the movie um mm -hmm. not to be too cliche about it but we are actually daniel and i were just i just convinced him to get to get into a uh, altered carbon and i was like the books are so much better than the tv show it's so much more depth and the universe is more built out and, mm -hmm. but yeah so both when they're done like <laughs> dune for example like the books of you you can't say anything about the books of dune that's like in the criterion of all science fiction literature like you have to read dune but then they've tried to make movies three or four times there was like a mini series and like they just can't nail it so the last ones are decent but visually anyways yeah yeah i think i think the movies are definitely easier to watch just because the time commitment but to me the book is it you can't beat it right like any good movie usually has a good book behind it especially if you're looking at like fantasy sci-fi genre um, for sure and if you have a good imagination i don't know yes. there aren't that many directors that are better than your, <laughs> what you can dream up that's something i love bringing up because it's just hard to find the the funds to create a you know create a film or you know even a tv show that yeah. uh, has has that those graphics built in better than you could imagine it 100 yeah. percent um cast, would they you, cast this guy they wanted this guy for this <laughs> exactly uh, would you guys prefer fast transactions but high gas fees or slow transactions and cheap gas fees? For Arkai or in general? Every answer. In, you know, yeah. Whichever. Kel, I feel like Kel's going to be political and, and, and just argue the benefit of both this whole. <laughs> Do we have to pick one? Yeah, we have to pick one. Yeah, I would pick probably one. say slow transactions and cheap gas fees. But that's going to be... Actually, that, that's winning. I'm a bit surprised. But yeah, I, I'd, I'd go with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Faster is better. But nobody wants to pay for speed. So, I mean, I guess it depends. <laughs> it depends the application is. Yeah, sure. Slow. Slower. Okay, slow okay. Fair, fair enough. I think unless it warrants it, slow is probably what most people would do, right? If you have to wait 30 seconds for a transaction, it's, it's whatever. Um, for the most part. Unless you're trading and it, it has a huge impact. but. Did Next you ever up. send ETH like in the earlier days where you're sitting there like biting your nails for two <laughs> hours waiting for X number of like confirmations? You're like, oh, come on, come on. 
I can't say that I have. I can't say that yeah. I have. But I know like one of my biggest pet peeves is transferring off of, of a centralized exchange where it takes like 45 minutes, 50 minutes, you know, and you're yeah. just waiting for, for that money to these, move. And they're like, oh, for a coffee break. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like it's sure, 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 sure. completed 132 of 370, you know, like, and yeah, I'm like, exactly. oh, okay. Uh, next up, uh, networks, for example, like ETH, BSC, et cetera, or store of value like Bitcoin. Ooh. Which is better for an investment far, or just in investment, general? Investment. Um, I would say networks. Yeah, networks are the future. I mean, look, yeah, Bitcoin, hold it forever. But like, if you can't get anything done, all these dApps and all the cool services that are coming out, that's the future. The future. <laughs> I agree. There's a lot more upside potential for businesses and businesses are integrating with these networks. Fiction. Science fiction. <laughs> uh, gold or Bitcoin? Bitcoin, definitely. We can't be in the crypto space and pick gold. We'll be shut. So <laughs> it's Bitcoin by default. I I literally just received my throne made out of gold. So like, do I have to return it or? <laughs> you just forfeit your salary. That's all right. Sit on. Yeah, I can take him off the stage. Yeah, I can take him off the stage. Yeah, I can take off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> can all I? Right. Doing fiat? Can we? Is that an, no? Okay. <laughs> Uh, coins or tokens? What do you mean by that? Like physical so, coins? So, cards no, 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 no. So like, like coins would be like a network coin, right? So like ETH, uh, like Matic, uh, tokens would be anything oh, built right, on this yeah, network. Yeah. <laughs> I said tokens. Tokens? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be the same answer for the, the same reason as the DeFi projects or blue chips one. Um, okay. I think things built on the networks are more exciting. Well, they're more fun than the networks themselves. Even mm-hmm. the networks more definitely, definitely. Yeah. That's the stuff that people actually want to use. The networks are just what is the infrastructure to do so. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, sure, exactly. It definitely more fun. Like no one wants to sit and I mean, some people might want to, but it's not inherently fun to just sit and watch transactions on you know ETH. Whereas playing a game could be very fun. <laughs> yeah, well, we hope so. <laughs> uh, so I guess that kind of goes through the DeFi projects or blue chips. Everyone's kind of on the same side with, with that and with the tokens yeah. as well. Um, virtual reality or augmented reality? Mm. We were just talking about this with a potential um, artist we, we, we might be bringing on. Um, wink, wink. And they work <laughs> in... I think it was virtual, right? Yeah, it was VR. Yeah, so I'd probably say, I'd probably go into virtual, actually. I'm going to flip. I normally would have said augmented, but I think the better the technology does or gets, the more you'll be able to do with virtual because, you know, it doesn't have to essentially be an L2 on top of the real world around you. It could be literally anything. Um, Mm -hmm. But then augmented will be cool if, you know, you can do stuff um, as you're walking around. You can have maps built into your eyes and all this kind of crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But if it's gone to my head, I'll go with virtual. I would yeah. even say augmented just for the real world applications of like being able to visually walk around somewhere and have it translated to something you can understand instantaneous. Just like there's so many fun things you could do, actually useful things you could do with it. Um, yeah, they're doing subtitle glasses now, aren't they? Yeah. But VR is like super cool too. I mean, like for fun. I don't know about. I've seen these stadiums where people gear up and like have it's almost like paintball, but everyone's wearing VR gear. It seems pretty cool. Yeah, that's interesting. I I really like the idea of like both of them are awesome, right? I think VR would be more of that gaming thing for me, and then AR would mm-hmm. be more of that application. I've seen some really interesting stuff, like you know, like if you do have trouble seeing, uh, like or not even just trouble seeing, but like for something really far, right? It can almost zoom in, like some of these glasses. Can almost be like this zoom in function right and so there is real world mm-hmm. application if you could basically look through binoculars at the you know at the touch of a like just by tapping your glasses or something like that so I, I think that there's so much coming that we don't know about yet and there's probably going to be way more than that there definitely will so yeah the air cortical implant that lets you do <laughs> 50 times yeah 
and then yeah, people will be able to super. wear NFT skins in real life. <laughs> exactly. Through everyone else's goggles, they, they could pick an avatar. That would be mm-hmm. mental. Ooh, okay, taking notes, taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely yeah, think those things are coming, 100%. Yeah, yeah, give it a few years, we'll get there. Ooh, yeah. Gross, you're using your natural eyes to see these? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, next up, a story-based game or competitive yeah. game? interest and then also like uh as far as developing one i'm competitive here um and th- i always have been you know i played world of warcraft for a good 12 years which is a heavily story driven game i skipped all the quest log i was just you know i'm grinding to get the max level to play pvp mm-hmm. and all that stuff um but then i did appreciate like the fact that the world was cool made me want to play that game, even though I was there for the competitive aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also play lots of CSGO and stuff like that, and that you know clearly has zero storyline. So I'll have to go with the competitive here. Yeah, I yeah, I think not necessarily storyline per se, but like the world that it exists in, and even Counter Strike does. Ha- I mean, you're stopping the terrorists, man. Come on. Um, but like <laughs> games that have rich worlds, I think do bring. I personally enjoy them where I think it brings you back because you're like, I'm, I'm loving being here and I'm loving what's happening. And the gameplay has to be awesome. But it's really amazing if it's also like, I want to spend time. Or like World of Warcraft, if the lore and the world and everything wasn't fun and colorful and engaging, you probably wouldn't have spent 12 years grinding away in it. Would have been like, oh, okay, on to the next MMORPG. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Definitely a good point. Uh, I think the competitive aspect for me is super super important but i also love story games so it's really hard to it's hard to pick one for myself at least um last up what in crypto or DeFi are you two both most excited about integrating with your project the big question you want to you want to i know what my, what my answer is but go, go for it go for it um just like properly done player owned assets like thing i people throw a lot of buzzwords around about utility and everything like that but actually building in value into something that you're going to want to use want to play with care about leveling up um i think we kind of haven't seen that yet and something that carries on from our you know initial rts title to whatever we make in the future like it's going to be yours um and it just it's going to have so many avenues of providing value and fun and when you're done with it if you want to sell it or you want to keep it or you want to do it it's your choice to do whatever you want and there's going to be some intrinsic value in there and you're going to have a good time doing it the whole time so yeah a fine balance daniel yeah i would i would agree with a lot of that you know i think uh the days of uh teenagers or parents forking out money for their kids to buy Fortnite skins and then your kid's friend stopped playing Fortnite and then his skins now mean nothing because he has to go and play Valorant. Um, <laughs> I think those days will be behind us soon enough. It's just a flawed model. Um, you know, these assets, because, you know, and then people try to even sell their Fortnite accounts and get the, the accounts get blacklisted by Epic Games. So uh, the money's just gone. It, it's... You know, we're a business, so ultimately we are in, you know, making money is important. Um, but I think the current models of 99% of the money is made by the company and it's not shared back in a in an economy that's open to the player base. You know, the, the, the game can't exist without players. The, the revenue should be shared. The asset appreciation should be something that um, the players gain exposure to. So I think, yeah, leveling that... Um, in what we're calling the game three model um mm. and really just being able to onboard tons of, of regular gamers into the crypto world in a seamless way rather than a you know i started in DeFi uh, a year and a half ago and it was a steep learning curve i will say it was a, <laughs> i made a few plenty of mistakes along the way so um yeah yeah, yeah that's awesome that's awesome i really like that it's a, a very good point and both of you guys kind of had similar similar thoughts on that so now that we're kind of we got to know you guys both a little bit better, uh, why don't we hop into some introductions on who both of you guys are, what roles you play in the project, and then we'll dive a little bit deeper afterwards. Sure. Should I kick things off? Yeah, yeah sure. 
Yeah, beautiful. Um, so I'm Daniel, or KO, some, some of you might know me. Um, I'm the CEO of Arclight Studios. I'm co-founder with John, who I'm sure will introduce himself in a second. Um, you know, as CEO, I have uh, a lot of the big picture responsibilities. Um, I don't get to be as hands-on as I'd possibly like, even though, um, you know, I'm definitely attending all the creative meetings and having my say on, on how the game should look. Um, I've been a gamer my whole life, so creating a game studio is something I always, it was something I wanted to do before crypto came, you know, before I came into the crypto scene and, and DeFi and understood all the possibilities here. Um, I came into crypto through GameFi, um, some other projects on some of the chains, and I saw a great deal of potential, but a lot left to be improved upon, especially coming from a traditional gamer perspective that didn't know you know, I, I wasn't someone that came through crypto. I was someone that came through playing games, and then that got me into crypto through GameFi. Um, I think it was a much messier journey than someone who comes to GameFi through crypto. Um, so that's kind of where our approach was born to where gaming is a really great opportunity to bring people into crypto in a way that, you know, beyond the NFTs are stupid pictures of monkeys and I can right click save them and there's this whole sentiment about NFTs that they're a scam and they're stupid and there's no benefits to them. Uh, we think gaming is a great opportunity to actually educate people on why it's in their interest to support this technology and how it can help them um, rather than just be stupid JPEGs. So that's me and then I'll hand over to John. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. Uh, yeah. I'm John or Kel. Uh, as you like it, I'm the CCO for Arclay Studios, so all things creative kind of fall under my umbrella. Um, visual stuff, lore stuff, story, gameplay, everything. Um, yeah, I come from a creative background, and similar to Daniel's experience, I, um, I've been into crypto for a while, and I didn't see beyond the tokens or the coins and kind of what they were doing as a speculative investment thing. And then GameFi kind of popped up. And it was this whole new, really the world is, a lot of the world that is, I think, in the market for learning about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology is going to have their introduction through gaming. Um, I've loved games my whole life. I'm, I'm a bit older than Daniel. So my, <laughs> the first gaming system I ever owned was called Intellivision. And you guys can Google that. Um, that, I mean, I didn't know when my parents bought it, but let's take a look. Yeah, so I mean, like, I was like, when Mario came along, I was like, who's this colorful guy? Eight bits? Ooh, fancy. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, I've been playing like RTSs and FPSs since forever. And I think we kind of our whole team has that experience and that nostalgia and that like really fond memories and also like the passion currently for what's happening in the space and kind of making like we were touched on earlier, like, making sure there's a great story behind it, making sure these are great characters that you are going to fall in love with, that the community, it's time the community had a say in the direction of the project. It's time the community earned some of the revenue that was coming from the project. So just all these, it's really, it really is not to be cliche, but a paradigm shift in the space. And I think we're kind of really pushing for that. And we're really excited about having the potential to do that. And now it's just like, building 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 making it happen scaling up and just see it's amazing seeing all these things spring to life and come to reality and it's like where vision actually is becoming a game um and it's just really exciting stuff yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. i love that i looked up the the intellivision that you uh <laughs> that you mentioned beeps and bips man it was like nothing i think it was, it was math with apes but like yeah it stuck and then it was nintendo and onward from there yeah and that, I, I guess nintendo is really where things started taking off like at this time I, I don't think at least you don't hear a lot about those days right you hear all about the super mario days when and you know i think that's where a lot of people really got started but that's super really nintendo, awesome playstation one playstation two man they had some <laughs> phenomenal phenomenal games yeah, that that's really really awesome. I I'm a I'm pretty young myself, so I wasn't around for a lot of the uh like the early early uh things. You guys ever hit but... those N64 days? You ever played Goldeneye? <laughs> nope, I can't say. Yeah, I have. Was, this is I mean it would be trash to play now, but that was the absolute height of like four player competitive. 
screen watching on your friend's screen because the monitor split <laughs> into four. Yeah, it was. I mean, yeah. So there was a magic there, and I think we're trying to we're throwing back a bit to that. But yeah, and also looking to the future. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and kind of branching off of what you guys kind of gave as your intro, you know, we we got to know you guys a little bit more. Um, why don't we do a little bit of a deeper dive into your project and how you guys are bringing this, you know, focus on DeFi and allowing the ownership of in-game items to, uh, to your project. Yeah, we'll so um, beginning. just jumping in on that. We have a, you might have, I think I mentioned it before, Game 3 is a kind of a, a new term that we're trying to coin. Um, that is the, uh, you know, there's Game 5 that exists, but we think um, a lot of projects have already used the Game 5 stamp and the Game 5 brand. Uh, and we think it's, um, we think there's more that can be done with it. So we're trying to go with a new, a new, um, new branding and something that'll be established in, in the future. You know, projects will say are using the game three model. Um, and what that involves is a series of uh, new technologies that we've uh, crafted working um, together. Um, so you've got things like, you know, in a marketplace, people will be able to purchase um, NFTs with credit card, with Apple Pay, with bank transfer, whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, that's, it's been done before. OpenSea has it. A few of the other NFT marketplaces have it. Um, but we've taken that a step further, and you can actually do that entirely walletlessly. So um, users will, will be able to sign in with email and password, you know, create an account like they would anywhere else, purchase an NFT with a credit card, and then start playing and earning the benefits of that NFT without a wallet. So the way that's going to work is we have a smart contract that is going to hold that player's NFT and it will track the ownership to a Web2 social. Um, so it will say, you know, this user that uses this email and password um, owns this NFT when he plays with it. Um, you know, the, the, the ownership is tracked, things he's earning, um, you know, weapons he's unlocking, whatever it might be. It's going to, to him, he's going to seem like he's just playing a traditional game. Uh, game, sorry. Um, but actually, these are NFTs on chain. And then we have an education hub where these players are promoted to, you know, in a fun, digestible and in-house way. Um, I think similar to something you guys are doing. I remember talking with Zach, you guys have an education center. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they, they, we'll have videos on them on how to create a wallet. And then they can claim those NFTs to their wallet when they want to. Um, and dive into the, you know, start exploring the blockchain and what the actual NFTs permit, um, all these kind of things after the fact. So they can, they can buy an NFT, start using it, enjoy the benefits, play the games in the ecosystem, all without having to do the wallets, the RPCs, the, mm -hmm. you know, send up gas, KYC and with a centralized exchange, all of these hurdles that a lot of traditional gamers will see it and say, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Why should I have to give my ID to Binance to start playing a video game? That's stupid. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're trying to remove all of that. Yeah, and I think a lot of those barriers to entry are things that even myself personally, I would look at them and be like, oh, this is too much work. Like, we're, I just want to have fun, and I heard this is cool, but, like, what, you want this and that, and this is going to take me an hour to do this, and I have to learn about mm -hmm. that. And Yeah, but like, I, I want you to have fun. I want you to jump in there. We want you to jump in there and, like, start enjoying yourself as, with as minimal of a process as possible. Yes. And then be like, I'm having a great time. This was great. And then once you spent some time, you're like, you know what? Maybe I do want to learn about this stuff and then come to it that way. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's really, really important. I, we talk about it. I swear I, I bring it up every single AMI I have because I think projects are starting to realize it. The user interface is one of those, one of the, I'd say the two or three biggest pieces that is keeping, you know, that's keeping people from actually entering the space. So, so that's really, really massive. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and kind of branching off. So with the idea of like removing this whole, you know, barrier to entry with the RPC and everything like that, um, are you, I guess what, how far are you going to kind of, uh, to kind of hit that goal? Like, are, are you guys completely taking out the need to connect the wallet to start? Are you guys... Yeah. Yeah, Chris, okay. I will come to your house and I will input the data uh, of the RBC for you. So anyone that this is... <laughs> gotcha, yes, gotcha. that's your question. You can play entirely walletlessly, side by side with someone who is using a wallet. So, you know, when these games go to PvP, you'll have what is essentially Web3 players and Web2 players literally playing side by side or against each other. That's um, really, really cool. 
the same as making like a Steam account or anything like that. Yeah. Maybe, so. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really, really awesome. So so it's going to be, how would that integrate? So is your, uh, I guess, is your whole platform built on Web3 then? And then you're allowing people to just connect without, like, by not, you know, by not logging into a MetaMask a- or any type of wallet? It's a it's a blend. It's kind of you know some people are calling it Web two point five, but that has <laughs> an implication that it's not Web three yet. Whereas it's uh-huh. kind of uh, it, it's Web a board. it's a blend. The benefits of both. <laughs> um, we think we think crypto mass adoption is going to come when DApps and and apps and companies are leveraging blockchain in the background rather than at the forefront. So from the user experience mm-hmm. point of view, they don't have to do all these complicated steps. But actually behind the scenes. Um, these things are operating mm-hmm. on chain. You know, to answer your question, not everything is going to be Web three. The game servers, etc. You know, they're, they're going to be Web two servers. They're going to be uh, traditional servers. Um, and then when you finish the round, whatever, whichever of our games you're playing, however, however much you earn, uh, you know, however much arc you earn, the server will send a request um, to smart contracts, and then they will credit your wallet associated to the account that you're playing with, however much arc you earned. So it's this kind of hybrid flow between Web 2 and Web 3 um, that creates this easy onboarding and frictionless onboarding um, for the players that don't know this um, while they reap the benefits of it behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something, to, so something to add to that also is that um, we're trying to also minimize the number of clicks and sign-ins and confirmations. So that's kind of hosting stuff on our own servers so that you don't have to literally every single time something is done confirm on chain it's kind of just enjoy the game so that's built into that as well gotcha gotcha yeah i really really like the the kind of thought process going behind it and at the end of the day let's say you guys are wrong it doesn't really affect you because you still have that web3 side that people are able to use like let's say everyone you know because of you know just the position i think a lot of gamers are in if they really like a game that they're, they're going to be the first ones to adopt to this chain, right? But you're not taking away the idea of getting someone completely new into the whole gaming scene either. So I, no, I really, no, really like that. It's absolutely open to everyone. Yeah, that, well, that's I, really I awesome. think our initial core audience are going to be people that are in the GameFi space already and mm-hmm. be like, I'd like something better than what <laughs> yeah. currently games that I'm playing that aren't really games that are more financial vehicles that i kind of like if there's money i'll click a hundred times um mm-hmm. yeah come have fun yeah for sure and, and i guess kind of if you guys want to uh get a little deeper into exactly the game side of what you guys are building because i know we've kind of touched up on you know how your is it are you guys at arclight you guys are building more of a infrastructure for a bunch of different games that correct as well as well as some okay okay awesome um would you mind diving a little bit deeper into you know the piece that you guys are taking and where you're trying to integrate maybe with some other projects or that kind of thing yes so we're we're starting out i would say you know we're we're a game studio first um and then we're building the architecture around you know the the priority is developing fun games and delivering Mm -hmm. those um to the players and uh, that's that's the core of what we're doing. The Web3 architecture that supports it is just to allow us to take these games from Web2 into Web3 and, and provide the, the benefits of having on-chain assets. Um, so in terms of the the games we're building, is that kind of what you're asking more specific about the games? Yeah, yeah. So so I, I wasn't 100% sure on if you guys were sticking with only games built by Arclight Studios or if you were going to open up the infrastructure to allow, you know, almost right. like like a steam sort of uh yes okay yeah so um so yeah this marketplace is going to start out with just arc light assets mm-hmm. um but we already have plans to open those up so other gaming projects will be able to list their gaming assets on our marketplace you know originally or to begin with that won't involve leveraging our systems like the infinity roster um or this kind of walletless play uh custodial services as cyril as as um you know, that's to answer your question. Essentially, yes, it's kind of a temporary custodial service until they make a wallet. So, yeah. in the long run, there'll be other. You know, this will essentially do this as a service for other games that want to leverage mm-hmm. this without building the infrastructure themselves. Yeah. Um, but 
also if we just become you know if if we're one of the big points of adopting you know of, of traditional gamers adopting blockchain then all these other on-chain games have a really big vested interest in capturing some of that audience that we're bringing in. Because, you know, these are, these are crypto players. They're starting to learn the benefits of blockchain and why you should play games on blockchain. As much as they might love the art of like games, they're going to want to find other games. They're going to want to explore the rest of the scene. So we think we have a really good opportunity for, you know, marketing, advertisement, uh, collaboration, partnership deals with other on-chain games, even other, you know, um, even Binance might be interested in advertising on the Artcloud website because all these new crypto users are potential mm -hmm. uh, users for them. You know, they're not claimed by a centralized exchange yet, if, you know, claimed, if you will. Um, yeah. So these centralized exchanges, even whole chains, are going to have a vested interest in capturing some of these fresh crypto users. Um, so, yeah, we definitely, definitely see opening up those, those services to um, games outside of the Artcloud universe. Um, and even in the future, who knows, uh, potentially acquiring some early stage games or some smaller games that may be a traditional Web2 games that we see. Actually, this could work really well, either specifically in the Arclight universe or just as an on-chain game. And actually acquiring those games into the studio, um, you know, possibly bringing on the team that's working on it or transitioning the work onto our own teams and then uh, deploying that into, into our ecosystem. So, yeah. I think Steam is the dream, something, a similar model to that. <laughs> yeah. And also, how nice would it be, like, me as a gamer coming into a new space, being like, okay, so this is awesome, what's next? And having some curated selection by someone mm -hmm. I trust who's actually played the games and knows what's yeah. quality and what. And like, dude, check this one out. Yeah, Everyone 100%. 100%. And, and kind of branching off, that kind of leads me to another question, because... I 100% want, like, I'm most excited to get into some of the games you guys are developing. But real quick before that, because you just said, like, Steam is kind of, you know, Steam is the dream. Um, <laughs> kind of, there have been some problems recently with Steam competing with, uh, at least problems in the thought of Steam trying to compete with some Web3 and some other companies coming up because their model is so, uh, they benefit far more than they're giving value to a lot of these games. Um, did, I say, and, did I say Steam was the dream? Sorry, I meant high self-esteem is the dream. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I think uh, I think you guys have probably most likely you know understand where I'm coming from with this. Um, yeah, what is kind of the model that you would be able to work with projects on, and you know, new potential games on if they are using your your onboarding service? Um, because right now Steam profits a lot of money for what it's actually providing and the speeds it's actually providing and, and all these different functionalities um but yeah i was kind of curious to hear your guys thoughts on that yeah i think our revenue sharing model is wildly different than what mm -hmm. steam is using um and that's i think a big part of our whole ethos is like actually letting people take ownership over things and not not trying to take things away from the players or the creators of the games but giving back to them mm -hmm. and letting them and part of that is like your own profits and not taking those profits away from you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if Dan has something more specific to touch on. Yeah, I mean, we, we'll, you know, we'll charge a, um, a platform fee for listing those assets, but we're not going to, you know, tear these, these projects apart because, frankly, it's in our interest to see a successful, um, you know, game five, game three, whatever we call it, revolution happen for the space. That's mm -hmm. good for our own adoption, you know. It, we'd rather succeed with other games and, and see gaming really properly transition. I mean, right now you have two and a half billion players playing traditional games. You have one and a half million, between one and a half million to two million, according to that radar and, and various sources. Um, while it's playing blockchain games, that's 0.05% of the total market share. You know, this is unbelievably early at what this could look like in 20 years. So we don't want to be. You know, frankly, if we rip these projects off, someone else is going to come along, do it cheaper, and 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 steal that, um, steal the opportunity to create this really um, connected community of crypto mm -hmm. gamers, which is where we see gaming going. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think 
it's in our interest to you know be giving really fair rates and and encouraging these projects to come and list their assets with us and you know they're totally free to also use OpenSea. there's no exclusivity clause you know we're not going to eat into their actual independent revenue models and their their own tokens any of that we're not going to do that it's, it's just going to be a um a very fair platform fee for the services which we provide them yeah and i think yeah Currently, our idea was to have some of the lowest fees for a marketplace. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. That's really, really good to hear. Um, and I, I kind of figured you guys are going about it. I mean, the whole structure kind of is more, more in the hands of uh, the individual holders of these different assets. So uh, definitely an interesting structure compared to, you know, the conventional market. Um, and kind of, kind of branching... Uh, from that, do you guys want to start getting into some of these these more exciting pieces? You know, looking into the actual games that you're developing. Because yeah, I know I've been staring at this picture a couple times. Uh, <laughs> that's all. That's like really all that we've been been shown here in Cardinal House. Uh, do you want to start to do a little deeper dive into the actual games you guys are developing? Yes. Yeah, sure. So um, we have currently the the one we've teased to everyone. Uh, with that in-game image is mm -hmm. Defiance Uprising. That's going to be our first game to hit the market. It's a, a real-time strategy game akin to, you know, StarCraft II, um, other, you know, RTS games like that. Mm -hmm. All the scope, so players won't have to control hundreds of, of units at the same time. Um, it'll be, you know, somewhere between six and ten maybe um, crew members. Um, and it's going to be, Kel, do you want to explain this? I don't want to say you've done it too much. Yeah, yes, of course. So I don't know if anyone here is familiar with like Age of Empires, Command and yes. Conquer. Um, <laughs> there was, there was Warcraft three before there was World of Warcraft. They did their own real time strategy game. So it's kind of that, um, but also mixed with a more, I like to say it's a squad based real time strategy game. Um, that has a lot of the RPG elements that you would see in an action RPG or in a turn-based strategy game, but it's played in real-time strategy. So if anyone's familiar with, like, the XCOM franchise or Wasteland, things like that, where your character has stats, has abilities, you level these things up, you get to choose on a skill tree what path you want your characters to take. Uh, and all of that is played out in real time. So as you're encountering enemies, you have the option to use certain abilities. You're gearing all your characters up. You choose their weapons. You choose their armor. You choose how you use these items, and all of those items are also going to be customizable. So it's just a really much more RPG in depth per crew member um, mm -hmm. than you normally see in an RTS. And we don't have a major building element. There's no, there's not a lot of base building that type of stuff. Your squad is what you're focused on, and you're bringing these guys in to do a mission, and it's tactical. And you get in, you do what you have to do, and you get out. Uh, and there's combat. There's mining, there's using a lot of abilities, um, and we think it's going to be really fun. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I personally want everyone to fall in love with their crew. So each individual is going to be an individual. Yeah, that's definitely a big thing for us. Um, especially because, you know, these, these crew NFTs, while you'll originally be using them in the RTS, um, as we expand into the, you know, the mobile game, the... FPS game, it's going to be the same crew NFT. So, you, you know, you put your heart and soul into leveling them up and, and crafting them um, in the RTS. You shouldn't have to start from zero um, in the FPS. A lot of the, especially stylistically, the, the cosmetics, things like that, you'll be able to take them into the FPS uh, and not have to buy whole new assets. Um, and just touching on that briefly, in terms of cosmetics, we also have, um, we basically have a, a, an arc like creators program where players or just artists will be able to submit, um, you know, cosmetic designs. Um, I don't want to say skins, but, you know, stuff like CSGO skins or uh, Valorant cosmetics for the weapons and all this kind of stuff. The community will be able to vote for their favorite uh, periodically. And let's say if 10 cosmetics get chosen by the community, they'll be added to the game, they'll be added to the marketplace, and the artists that created those assets will earn royalties every time their cosmetic is bought and sold and traded and all of that so um we're all about sharing that revenue and, and creating this as i said open economy that whether it's players or artists whatever it might be 
um, you have an opportunity to, to participate and earn from the economy. So I am super excited. That's really, really awesome. I love the idea of having that, that strategy game uh, and definitely spent a lot of hours in different strategy games. So that's uh, really, really awesome to hear. Um, kind of kind of taking a little piece from that. Um, do you guys have any kind of idea on release dates or is there anything that people can do to interact with with these games so far? Right now, there isn't. Um, it's an unpopular answer. I know there's a lot of people <laughs> that are very excited to get into the games. Um, right now, we're in a stage and we're coming out of a stage of, you know, having taken this real business approach, um, there's a lot of stuff to do with lawyers, stuff to do with mm -hmm. networking, um, you know, talking to VCs, talking to chains, talking to, you know, all these partnerships, setting up equity structures. So there's a lot of this boring stuff that we're having to get out of the way um, that isn't very exciting for the players. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a critical part in allowing us to expand the team, bring on, you know, we've already got a really good roster of game devs and we're really proud of uh, the MVP uh, version of the game that we have currently. But, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, we want to see the team expand reasonably rapidly. Um, and, you know, we're going for AAA level um, mm -hmm. games. And that takes a certain amount of resources and time, unfortunately. Uh, it's the answer no one wants. But um, <laughs> I will say we're looking at starting to really get things rolling in terms of, obviously, we have the Infinity Pass sale. And that mm -hmm. Infinity Pass for the people that purchase and hold that NFT, they will be the first ones to get their hands on the game when we do that kind of public beta release. Well, I guess it's private, but to Infinity Pass holders, um, they will be the first ones that get to dive in and, and, and give us that, you know, be part of the development process, give that feedback. And um, we really want people to feel involved in that sense rather than just having to play the end result. We want people to participate in helping us make it the way they want it. So, um, a bit of a political answer. I haven't given you a specific timeline, <laughs> um, but yes, soon. Gotcha. Soon. 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 <laughs> uh, and so, how how would somebody? I'm sorry. What was that? Yeah, I don't know if I nothing ate. for me. Okay, <laughs> I, I'm not me. sure. I thought I thought the killed said something. My bad. Um, Hello. <laughs> um, are, we, are we live? Is this happening? What time? What, what's going on? Oh um, yeah. But, no. So kind of kind of with that, it is it is unpopular, but it's very understandable with the scale that you guys are trying to to bring. And can you touch up on how people can get involved uh, now that aren't, you know, in those VCs? Uh, because obviously those are very limited to, you know, income and different different uh, financial statuses. So how would someone that is listening to this get involved with what you guys are doing? Uh, and I just want to touch on I usually save that for the end, but I kind of want to touch up on that real quick because you, you'd uh, introduce. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, right now I would say there's only so much people um, can act actively do other than, you know, engage with the, engage in our Discord and stuff like that. We haven't been doing too much from a, a marketing or engagement um, perspective yet. We're going to really kick that, um, you know, get that started this month. Um, it's just been a lot of behind the scenes stuff up to now, so it's kind of been a bit of a soft launch. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't think we'll do any kind of token presale um, specifically, just because I'm personally of the belief that um, presales can a lot of the time you have a situation where you absorb a lot of the buy pressure that would have hit the LP. You absorb it into presale, and then you launch the LP, most of the people that want to buy your token have already bought it in the pre-sale. Um, there's very little buy pressure left, but you just now have a bunch of people that have a, have a token um, and that bought it at a discount. So I think it can lead to initial dumping, potentially. You know, I've, There's a lot of pre-sales that have gone well. I'm not saying it, it doesn't mm -hmm. ever work. Um, yeah. But we're probably not going to do a token pre-sale um so it would be the the first kind of thing that people could get their hands on would be the infinity pass um yeah gotcha yeah. gotcha and when is that coming out <laughs> um we're probably <laughs> probably looking for well to be completely honest it we're kind of um 
we're scaling it a bit based on the community at the time. So we don't want to, um, you know, we're going to be trying to grow the community a lot in the next few months and start doing proactive marketing and mm -hmm. uh, putting out a lot more content and all this stuff that we haven't been doing so far while we've been focusing on other things. Um, so we kind of have a general community milestone idea in mind uh, um, of which, you know, when the community is somewhere around this size, we'll probably look at um, trying to gauge appetite for the Infinity Pass and then launching from there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very reluctant to give a specific date just because I know then everyone will <laughs> <push fires laughs> and say, you said, you know, you Do said you have like a range? second week of November. Like an earliest would, that it would happen. Um, I would say the earliest it would happen is probably mid-November. Um, and then we're looking at anywhere between kind of November, December, January. Um, there's gotcha. a certain appeal to doing it in January and saying, you know, 2023 is the year of, uh, of our yeah. and that's when we, you know, we do it kind of, uh, calendar wise and really kick things up in 2023. Yeah. Um, but I'm very conscious that that is the <laughs> unpopular answer to the people that are already excited in the discord. I think, um, I think it makes sense, you know, yeah. I, under promise over deliver if it comes out sooner people will be more excited but i definitely think allow it you know letting people know and making sure that people find out before i think a lot of people want to know so that they can check back in around that time and not yeah. miss it so i think that we'll definitely have you on for another AMA before then so it's not to worry for sure. For sure. um kind of kind of leading from that though so we can get into some more of these questions uh someone asked i see on your website that arca uh is it arca is that how you pronounce yeah okay okay Arca is going to be used for all your games. Does that mean if I earn tokens in one game, I can take them and use them for another game? That's correct. Um, so, you know, all the things that you'll be able to purchase with Arca, whether it's cosmetics or upgrades or whatever it might be, um, you can, you know, if, wherever you earn those within the ecosystem, you can spend them anywhere else within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, so that's totally open. Uh, you might, you know, play the RTS, and then later on you're playing on 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 the mobile game and you want to buy something on the mobile game, you have access to the same tokens that you earned earlier playing the RTS. So yeah, totally shared, totally um, spend it wherever, earn it wherever. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, what partnerships do you guys currently have? Um, kind of going back to, I know you guys have been meeting with a lot of behind the scenes people. So I don't know if you had a lot of time to focus on this, but, uh, and what qualities are you looking for in different partnerships? Yes. So, um, I don't know. Do I give alpha here? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know. <laughs> yes, uh, the answer is always yes. Do we want alpha? I guess we could do some alpha. <laughs> um, we have, um, we've been selected to collaborate uh, with Polygon Studios. So we're really excited about that. And they're going to be involved in, you know, helping us with development, with marketing, with partnership acquisitions. Um, you know, all these kind of things, they, it, for people that don't know, Polygon Studios is a subgroup of Polygon, um, and they are specifically devoted to, um, kind of culture projects within the Polygon ecosystem. So that could be gaming, it could be fashion, it could be, um, you know, social things, anything of that nature. That um, is really cool. Yeah, so we're working with them, and then there's a few VCs, I don't think I'm allowed to be specific about that. Um, but we're, we're in relations, I will say with a few VCs, um, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, that's also relevant to working with Polygon themselves, you know, Polygon, uh, have a prerequisite that for them to invest or look at partnerships, official partnerships with a, a protocol, um, they have to have a VC already on board with them. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we spoke with Polygon and they said, you know, get to that stage and come back to us, but they're very excited about the, the project. That is um, really, really cool, though. That's awesome. Yeah. It's very yeah. exciting stuff. <laughs> very, very high. <laughs> nothing more than to shout it from the rooftops and stamp it on our website. So as soon as it's finished, everyone will know. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. That's, that's really, really cool to hear. Um, do you guys have any, as far as, you know, in the upcoming months, I know you said that you're planning on bringing more and more people in, which these partnerships are going to definitely help with that. Um, but do you guys have any other strategies that you guys are doing to grow the user base and enhance the user experience kind of leading up to your launch? 
Yeah, so I'm very much of the um, build a great product before you start. I think there's an element of, you know, marketing is important from the outset. You want to be growing that community. But I do think having a great product to market is arguably the most important part, you know. So right now we're really focusing on onboarding really great uh, artists, great game devs with tons of experience with existing AAA quality games and some big titles that people will will recognize um and really getting our um alpha i'll say um for rts for defiance uprising to a really good um attractive point to where you know we can move into game teasers and and gameplay demos and and proper trailers on youtube and all this stuff that i think will be much more effective for marketing and, and acquiring users especially traditional game users that are used to this um you know i think crypto has a lot of and it's something i like about crypto is you build the project while you build the community whereas a lot of traditional gaming has you build the product and then you launch it to the community and the community comes because of the product mm-hmm. um so we're trying to do kind of a, a blend in the middle because we really want the community to be part of the development and, and seeing it. But we also know that right now, um, what people want to see is get that you know mm-hmm. get their hands on the game and, and and jump in. So we're trying to get to that point as as quickly sure. as possible while developing and, uh, delivering a great product. So yeah, yeah, and I also think we really want to do it in an organic way. We've seen a lot. We've been a part of a lot of projects as players. Uh, where we saw things happen and things grow really quickly and then fall apart because there's nothing mm-hmm. there and there's no solid core. So like mm-hmm. keeping people engaged and being a part of it, things like tweeting consistently, having a dev blog, having medium articles so that people can stay up to date with where we're at in a very transparent and accountable way and be like, we're building and I want you to know what we're building and what we're doing. So having that level. And I think now is kind of the start of us being a lot more conscious yeah. of hitting that social angle and making sure that the community is engaged because when it's time to go, we want to be something that we were, we've been quite critical of in the past is seeing these other projects that just don't have anything. We're like, Oh wow, it's so flashy. And then they're like, well, they said this is coming out and it's, we've been waiting for six months and something yeah. that we're really, really conscious of is having a product and having consistent releases that you want to see something, here's something to see. And we have it and we've been working on it. So yeah, I think that's important to us. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and that's that's a really, really big piece to touch up on. You guys don't want to blow up and then fall apart at the end. Um, yeah, kind of with that, are you guys offering any kind of like, or have you guys like thought about offering any kind of like alpha NFT to the people that are you know your early supporters that are that have been with you since the beginning and have kind of stuck with the community? Or is yeah, that so we have. Mm-hmm. No, we do. We have um, we have some roles in our Discord. Um, that there's actually still a few left, um, and they have different things. So, um, depending on the tier, you know, our Pathfinder role has whitelist spots for the Infinity Pass sale and a bunch of cosmetics and titles um, for each game we make. So, you know, for the RTS people with a Pathfinder role, they'll have, uh, you know, they'll get maybe three. Um, cosmetics and then with the release of the mobile game they'll get another three and with the release of the fps they'll get another three so they kind of have this ongoing as we roll out um they'll constantly be getting uh different assets and stuff to that yeah. only these people have yeah that, that's really really cool um and then we have we have another one coming in if the game is free to play for a lifetime how do you plan to pay out players of the game um does this apply to what you guys are building? Yeah, so, um, you know, we've seen time and time again, GameFi is a really hard model from a tokenomics perspective to get right with just a, a single game. Um, when you turn that into one token for a whole game studio that has to, you know, survive for a decade or however, however, may, however long it may be, um, it's something you have to get really, really right. Um, it's our tokenomics model is something we're working on with um, really experienced uh, DeFi people, including people at uh, Polygon and, and people that run really successful protocols on Polygon at the moment themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, the essential aim is that the utility provided by the 
asset people are earning, you know, whether it's buying cosmetics, power-ups, uh, replenishing, um, I don't want to go too much into game alpha, but I know there's a lot of things <laughs> that people are going to need to spend their earnings on as well okay, as cashing them out. Us. We're good with it. <laughs> no, you want me to tell you. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, it's 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 establishing this, and it's something we'll closely monitor. You know, Axie had to make a really big pivot um, recently to save one of their tokens because they, you know, they looked at the the free to earn model, if we'll call it that, and they saw, oh, this is not going to be sustainable. You know, it's too many people are earning without. You know, a lot of people, because Axie had even the single player content was free to earn um, mm -hmm. and their token was just getting killed. And and one thing they did is they maintained centralization over their tokens and their tokenomics mm -hmm. so that they could they could see this. They ran the numbers. They did the analysis and said, oh, we need to change this. And because they had the centralization, they could change yeah. it. Um, and they managed to save their token and, and you know, uh, other yeah. market factors aside. Um, yeah. And coming at your question with a different answer it's multiple revenue streams it's not yeah, yeah. That, it's all different things coming in from different places and making sure that we're always putting that back into the game mm -hmm. into the players so that's it so if someone isn't connected to you know with the wallet into the ecosystem as a whole how are they earning rewards or do they just forego those rewards yeah so the way it'll work um if you don't have a wallet you can still purchase and utilize the nfts at the end of the game, you know, every time you play a match, whatever it might be, you'll be shown, um, you know, you would have earned, let's say, 25 Arca during this mission. Um, but you need to create a wallet, click here to learn how. And so the um, walletless players will not be earning. They still enjoy the, you know, the upside potential of the assets that they've purchased. Um, mm -hmm. But they won't be earning the token until they make a wallet. Okay. Um, so that's kind of a, a middle ground we're doing. And we think that'll incentivize people to go ahead and, you know, I think we mm -hmm. think showing these people, you know, you'd be earning had you had a wallet, this is why you should do it and click here to learn how to do it within the, uh, the ArcLight website. We think that's a good way to incentivize them to, to be proactive and, and learn how to make a wallet and use a wallet and why they should do it. Gotcha, for sure. Definitely, definitely going to help uh, at least get some people on board with it for sure. Um. So your game, I know you talk about the strategy game, and I don't think this question necessarily, uh, it's, I think it's focused very much on a single game, but it, they're asking about, for example, PvP and whether the game will have PvP, but with the fact that you guys are developing so many different things, I'm sure at some point there will be a game on there that does. Um, yes. Yes okay. is the answer. Okay. Like, yeah, oh, okay. Well. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. PvP, awesome. PvP is a, a big part of everything that we're doing. <laughs> yeah. So the, the the RTS will definitely have PvP, and we're already coming up with some really cool mechanics mm -hmm. and game modes for that. Um, and the FPS, at least initially, will be exclusively PvP. Um, so for the FPS, we're looking at the kind of CSGO and Valorant model, um, whilst obviously bringing our own flavor and, and, and building upon what those games have already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a really big fan of the 5v5 uh, competitive FPS genre. Yeah. So it's something I'm really pushing for. Um, and I think we've got some... <laughs> Some very cool ideas to, to spice that up. So bring an Activision to uh to the blockchain. Just yeah, kidding. yeah. Um with uh with the dependence or what is the dependence of uh the studio and the games themselves on the on the stability and reliability of the blockchain? Um would it be possible to migrate to another blockchain in case of some issue similar to like what Phantom experienced? Uh or no, they said they remember you considering Phantom. Uh, what did you choose? Why did you choose Polygon? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, well, there's kind of three sub questions there. Um, in terms of dependence on the blockchain, um, in terms of it won't affect your gameplay. So, you know, if there's a if if Polygon has a really major issue or outage um, with getting transactions through, if you're in a game of PvP or whatever it might be, it will not impact your gameplay at all. Um, the only situation where it could be an issue is when you're doing these on-chain transactions so that might be at the end of the game you know claiming the rewards um or purchasing nfts on the website stuff like that sadly there's nothing we can do about that but um everything is all the transactions everything we do all of that stuff how much you've earned every round whatever it's all getting logged in a database so if there are issues like that 
we'll be able to see, you know, if you weren't able to claim your game rewards, we'll have that in our database and we'll be able to sort that situation out for you. So the the there shouldn't really be any major issues if um, the blockchains, if Polygon is having issues. Um, the second question, yes, we're definitely open to establishing the uh, opening this up to other chains and going cross chain and letting players come in from whichever chain a big um thing a, a, an important thing for me when it came to working with polygon studios was that there wasn't an exclusivity clause um which you know they were the first to say we're big believers in in cross chain and multi chain mm-hmm. future for, for you know they don't want projects to be stuck on just polygon um so we'll definitely be looking to to migrate and support cross chain, and why Polygon? Um, we think it's a really you know Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, all these massive companies have chosen Polygon to build on and to support you know for the Reddit and Instagram whatever. If you want to share your NFT on Instagram, it's done through Polygon. The Reddit avatar NFT marketplace is done through Polygon. Disney have their accelerator program where they picked six companies around the world um, to to work with and support and bootstrap. Five of those were crypto based. Polygon was the only chain they chose. So you know, and, and people think of Disney as a you know cartoon Mickey Mouse thing. In reality, mm-hmm. Disney is a uh, you know conglomerate with billions and billions and billions of dollars. And them choosing Polygon for us is a, a crazy bullish signal. So lots of factors in in in, in Polygon. We think it's. Yeah. They're doing a big game push. You know, the CEO um, of Polygon <laughs> comes from gaming at YouTube and is really bullish on gaming. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we think it's definitely the right place to be. I would have to agree. I think that's probably the blockchain you want to be on if you're developing, you know, anything related to uh, actual games that's being built on the blockchain that have real, yeah. that are super, super fun. And I, I think that's what's been missing. Uh, we have one more question from Carcat. If, uh, that's right. I want to be respectful of your time. I apologize. It's gone a couple minutes over. No, no, it's all good. Uh, don't worry. But it's been really, really fun talking so far. Carcat, uh, would you like to go through what you uh, wanted to ask? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, I wanted to start off just by saying that I absolutely love the principles that you're founding the studio on. I'm trying to convince my friends who are all gamers, but not all are into crypto, that like... Web3 and gaming is kind of no-brainer when you look at the economies that have already existed, but we're isolated to those games like CSGO and, you know, everything on Steam with Steam, you know, Steam dollars and all that sort of thing. So yeah. I think it's amazing that you guys are integrating that. My my question is is related to that, which is that my impression is that the vast majority of, you know, the millions and millions of um, kind of regular gamers um, have a pretty negative impression of crypto, almost like completely across the board. And so I was wondering if you guys had a plan for bridging that gap. And um, like you said, showing that NFT is not about all about JPEGs of apes and and that, um, you know, gamers can get into crypto without it being like an ethical issue or, you know, some fad or, or something like that. Kind of bridging the gap between um, the, the GameFi gamers and the, and the regular Web2 gamers. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. It's weird to hear your voice for the first time, but <laughs> really nice to hear you. <laughs> it's, it's great to hear you guys too. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's a, absolutely like it's something we talk about a lot um, in 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 our meetings, and there is a big, you know, it's a bit of a dilemma of people who are NFT and they hate it. You know, yeah. um, I speak about it with my girlfriend that's completely outside view, and you know, she's a bit biased now because she knows I'm working in this uh, market, but. If I ask her what an NFT is, you know, she thinks it's a $250,000 picture of a monkey. And because that's what gets <laughs> it. Like, the real utility doesn't, that's not what people hear about. People hear about the stupid stuff. And that's a really, really good looking monkey, though. Even, no comment. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, one, I think it actually gives us an advantage in a strange way over existing game studios because a lot of, you know, it's going to be hard for Blizzard or Activision or EA, whatever it might be, to transition into NFTs because a lot of their players already have a relationship with that game studio and they want them to be what they know them as. Yeah. And, you know, they're going to... We've already seen a few games, Minecraft, whatever it might be, that were kind of testing the waters with moving into that space and their community said, absolutely not, we don't want it. Because their communities already know and love them as as that thing whereas we are taking the approach of we're a new game studio that does this um 
you know, we're not transitioning into it. This is what we have done from the start. And this is, you know, we set out the business to do this uh, approach to NFT gaming. Um, and so we don't have to convert our users to liking it in a way. We can, you know, they, we think they will, we don't have to change their mind. They'll come for it when they understand yeah. why it's better. Um, so essentially, we, we want to make a game that is really fun. And the NFT stuff is almost in the background. You know, they don't have to engage with it. Some players might not even know they're buying an NFT. They just they just see a great game that they love and that the assets are they can buy and sell. You know, they yeah. might because because someone might come in buy a you know buy a cosmetic for the FPS, play with it for a while, and then be able to sell it. And instead of it being locked up in Steam points and having to go to some dodgy website to sell their CS:GO skins, they can just do it. You know they'll be able to sell and receive it on their credit card or whatever it might be um and so i guess to answer your question it would be not being too loud about it but then teaching them you know some projects are even coming up with alternative names for nfts and they're calling them um you know whatever it might be to dodge that stigma um right so i don't think we'll take that approach because i think it's important for people to you know for the web three people to know that it is the technology they know uh, and can rely on, but I think we'll not be too. I don't say not too loud about it because we're not hiding it, but just not making it. You know, our selling point is great, enjoyable games and fair, open ecosystems. And then the NFT bit is kind of how we do that rather than what we do. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. I think I think it's brilliant. I have three really quick points to add to this. Um, I'm going to paraphrase. It's an Alexis Ohanian quote. He is the ex. CEO of Reddit, I believe. He was basically saying, five years from now, no gamer is going to care about any of this. All the blockchain stuff is going to run seamlessly in the background. Uh, it's an absolute no-brainer that players are going to want to own their own assets in the form of NFTs. I think we've seen Ubisoft is moving into the Web3 NFT space. Square Enix is coming in. Uh, Epic and Lego have partnered. They're building their own metaverse. So look for that coming on uh, next year, two years from now. And when these projects come in here, gamers aren't there. If you want to play these games, you're, you will be participating in blockchain gaming. Uh, and they're going to figure out how to not make it a super intrusive, high barrier to entry. Guys that are playing on PlayStation and Xbox right now don't want to set up these accounts uh, and they don't see the value. And I think there's a ton, and not to go into a deep political conspiracy theorist answer here, but I think there's, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in these mega gaming companies where they want to make one cosmetic item and they sell it to you and then six months later there's a new version of whatever soccer game of the year and they're selling you all these cosmetics all over again you don't own anything and the second you're done with it you put it away and forget about it they don't care what diablo immortal just came out and someone spent what was it two hundred thousand dollars to like level this guy up and these guys are laughing they're like oh these guys are gonna go for this okay let's keep spoon feeding them all this stuff and i think if you st if you take a step back and you look at that model and go this is messed up man like this is not how it's supposed to be and you're gonna be bored with this stuff and you're gonna move on and you should have something from that if you want to play a game for 12 years you should have something you walk away with yeah and that but I'm passionate about it. So anyways, I digress. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think we're, we've, we're thinking about it. We've thought about it. Yeah, no, that, that's amazing. And I, I love hearing the passion because as soon as I saw kind of, you know, the docs and, and what you guys were doing, I was immediately on board. And I, I think awesome. it's, it's really great. I appreciate you. I see appreciate you. you too. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for coming on and asking asking that question. That definitely something important to touch up on. Uh, the reason thank why. You, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, Good question. And yeah, I, I guess the final bit I want to end off with, and real quick, if you guys do have a couple minutes to spare, we usually have like a uh, a cardinal crew, so all of our our cardinal crew members uh, get to hop on like a little post AMA. If you guys have a couple minutes, I know we've gone late, so it's totally fine if not, but. Uh, just uh, shoot me a DM if that's all right afterwards, and that would be really, really great. Uh, but to end off uh, the this AMA, which has been really awesome kind of hearing from you guys, what do you think, if you guys had to summarize your entire, uh, your entire motivation behind all this into a sentence or two, and how that kind of goes into your vision, what would it be? 
You mm -hmm. didn't want to go? I... Yes. Okay, I'll <laughs> give us. <laughs> it's a big question. Yes. Um, I think at the heart of what we're doing, or, or why this was something I wanted to do, um, it would be... I've put countless hours and a fair bit of money into lots of games, um, and I definitely appreciate the... I don't want to use magic because you know it's a bit of a cringy word, but the well, I'll use it. The magic that gaming can be, and 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 mm -hmm. the communities you can build through games, and you know all the benefits of gaming. Um, and I, when I, when we, you know, John, I, this isn't one sentence. I'm totally waffling, but um, having gone through GameFi to get to where I am, I am now obsessed with what GameFi can be if it's done right. I just, mm -hmm. I can't not do everything I can to try and deliver that. Um, yeah. So I would say what I'm trying to do is deliver what I really truthfully believe the new gaming industry should look like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I think we're passionate about games. We love video games. We see the value in them and we see things being somewhat mishandled by a lot of people. And like, we're like, this is the future. I believe that. I think we, I mean, probably most of the people that are here right now believe that, that like this is the direction that games are going in. And it's kind of our responsibility to make sure we stay on the path of like the future is supposed to get better. And this is for all of us to make the best quality games and have the most fun. And like, it's exactly like Daniel said, those magic moments. Like I have friends that are more digital than IRL, you know, that I've met. <laughs> and but like those crazy moments where you're like, Oh my God, it's four o'clock in the morning. Okay. One more round, one more round. But like, <laughs> that's that's great. That's it. That's I want everyone to have those moments where they're like, I'm having just an amazing time, and you own a piece of it, and you're a mm -hmm. part of it. Your voice is heard. Like that, I, it's important to me. I think it's important yeah. to everyone. So yeah, that's my take. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm super super excited to see. Uh, how everything goes for you guys and I really appreciate you guys for coming on and uh, chatting for you know an hour 15 um, again if you guys are available for like five minutes we'd love to have you uh, just let me know but uh, yeah, sure. thank you guys yep, so yep. much for for uh, hanging out and everything it is awesome and I'm sure we'll have you guys on again soon thank, yeah, you. thank you for having us and thank yeah. you to everyone for listening I know uh, at least for myself I'm a king of the waffle um, so I appreciate <laughs> everyone sticking awesome. with it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'm sure well, we'll be on again soon. Yes, yes. Thank you guys all for tuning in. It's always really, really awesome to get a good crowd here to listen to uh, some really quality projects. So have a wonderful day, guys. And uh, if you are part of the Cardinal Crew, make sure you hop in uh, the crew chat and we'll uh, be there shortly. But thank you. Have a good one, guys. Great. Cheers, everyone. Bye.